Great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So let's um, let me just say what we'll talk about today. So we'll continue with polynomials, and we'll hopefully get to secret sharing. And, and also, if you have time, erasure codes. OK, so let me start with a little bit of a review from last time for, for, for a few minutes. And then we'll, we'll start building on where we were last time. OK? So last time, we, we started talking about polynomials. right? And we were actually talking about polynomials over the reals. With, with, with real coefficients and, and real-valued polynomials. And then, um, um, and then we talked about two very basic properties that polynomials have. Okay, they, they might seem like very simple properties, but, but they are, you know, as you'll see over these next couple of lectures, these two very simple properties are extremely powerful. So they're like magic. Okay? So, so, so that's what we are, we are going to be talking about. OK. Um, okay um, sorry, can we, um, can we settle down out there? And uh, let, me, let me just reiterate uh, the, the, the policy about laptops. OK, so you're only allowed to use them for taking notes. All right? So if you're using them for anything else, you should just stop right now. Uh, at some point, meaning either later today or next lecture, depending upon, you know, if, if things are bad, we'll institute a no laptop policy, except for, you know, we might have a smoking section in the back where, you know, you, you, can, you can use them where you're not, not disturbing anyone else. Okay, so, so please be, be mindful of, uh, of your neighbors. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing other stuff with, with your laptops or your, or your phone or whatever else, then... You're not just disturbing yourself. You know, it's not just that uh, it's, a, it's a problem for you, but it's, it's also a problem for your neighbors in the class. And that's, that's what's not acceptable. OK? So, um, so, um, okay, so if, uh, you know, let, let's just uh, make sure that, that uh, people, are, people are going with these rules. OK, so, so let's, let's get back to polynomials. So what, what's a polynomial? Polynomial is of the form a polynomial of degree, degree d is, is of the form, so p of x equal to a sub d x to the d plus a sub d minus 1 x to the d minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a sub 1 x plus a sub no. Okay? And what we, what we said last time is that there are two very basic properties that polynomials have. OK, so, so by the way, a zero of the polynomial, uh, so, sorry, a, a root of the polynomial. So, so we say r is a root of p of x if p of r equal to 0. Right? So, so there were two properties we said. One, one is that a polynomial of degree D has at most D roots. And the second property was if you're told the value at D plus 1 points, so, so if you're given x1, y1 through x sub D plus 1, y sub D plus 1, distinct, you know, for for d plus 1 distinct x sub i. And you demand, and you want to, then there's a unique polynomial p of x of degree at most d such that p, p of x sub i equal to y sub i for i equal to 1 to d plus 1. Okay, so once you specify the value at d plus one points, that's it. You have specified the polynomial uniquely. Okay. 
So now, what we are going to do is today, instead of letting these, letting these, looking at polynomials over the reals, we look at polynomials where we are working modulo a prime. So what does it mean we are working modulo a prime? What it means is that these coefficients, each of these coefficients is going to be a number modulo mod q for some, some, some prime q. Okay, so we'll pick a prime q, we'll fix it, and now each of these coefficients is going to be a number, a, a number mod q. Or a number meaning an integer mod q. Okay? And then we'll also, we'll also demand that any time we substitute x, x is going to be a number mod q. And then when we see what's p of x, it's also going to be a number mod q. So any numbers we work with will be numbers mod q. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Now, it might seem like a very strange thing to do, okay, but, but why are we doing it? And, and what gives us the right to do this? Okay, so so, so let's, let's try to understand that. So, so wh what we are doing now is, is something that, you know, at first might, might not make sense. So, so we are fixing q, which is a prime. So maybe we fixed the prime q equal to 7. Okay? And now, what we are insisting is that when, when we write out a polynomial, that all the coefficients should be mod, mod 7. Okay? And then, not only that, but whenever you substitute x, it's number mod 7. Whenever you do arithmetic, you're doing arithmetic mod 7. What, whatever p of x is, it's going to be a number mod 7. Okay? So that's, that's what we're going to do. Now, why are we doing this? Well, it's precisely because when we, are, when we are working with polynomials, we do arithmetic. And what does it mean we do arithmetic? We, we are going to add, we are going to subtract, we are going to multiply, we are going to divide. And what are the properties when we, when we work modulo a prime? Well, we can, we can add any two numbers, we can subtract any two numbers, we can multiply any two numbers, and we can divide any number by any other as long as the number we are dividing by is what? Not zero. Right? Because, because we are not allowed to divide by anything which, is, which has GCD not equal to 1 with this. But, but since, since Q is a prime, the only thing which does not have GCD 1 with it is 0. Right? So, so we can divide as long so as... Long as so this is OK as long as don't divide by zero. Okay. Which means that all these operations are just like they were with the, over the reals. Right? So as long as when we were working with the real numbers, all we cared about was we could add, subtract, multiply, and divide as long as we were not dividing by zero, then the same things true, hold true when we, are, when we are working modulo a prime. Right? And the main point is that in order to get these two magical properties, we don't need any other properties other than these. The fact that when we are doing arithmetic, it's all okay, right? We can add, multiply, subtract, divide. That's all we make use of in getting these two properties. So now, if we are working with polynomials mod a prime, these same properties hold for us. And now, because we have these properties and we are working modulo a prime, then all kinds of nice things happen. So we can, we can use these polynomials and these properties to, do, to, to solve extremely interesting problems like secret sharing, like erasure codes, and even like error correcting codes. So we'll, we'll see that over these next couple of, couple of lectures. Okay, so that, that's where we are going with all this. Okay, so, so let's, let's, uh, let's do an example of this. So, so suppose that we are, we are working with q equal to 7, and we have a polynomial, say, 4 times x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x plus 6. So that's our polynomial. And, and let's, let's say that this is, this is p1 of x, and let's say we have another polynomial 
P2 of x, which is um, which is 3x plus 2. Okay. And now suppose we want to divide p1 of x by p2 of x. Okay. So remember, b these, these, these coefficients are all mod 7. And we want to divide, so, so we, want to, we want to say, what happens when we divide p1 of x by p2 of x? So, so what happens is that you can write p1 of x as p2 of x times some polynomial, okay, which is which is called the co quotient. Okay, so what should I call call it? Um, mm, I'm just going to call it S of x because I don't want to use Q of x because Q was this prime. And then plus R of x. Okay? So this is the remainder. So it's, it's exactly like if you were dividing one number by another. Right? You can also divide one polynomial by another. And you'll, you'll get, you know, it divides... And then you get a remainder. And then what property do you get for the remainder? So, so if you are dividing one number by another, then the property is that the remainder is smaller than the number you're dividing by. Right? Now the property for the remainder is that its degree is smaller than the degree of the, the polynomial you're, you're dividing by. So now the property is that the degree of R of x is going to be less than the degree of p1 of x. In this case, oh sorry, p2 of x. What you're dividing by. In this case, p2 of x has degree 1, so the degree of the remainder has to be less than 1, which means it can be 0, which means that this has got to be a constant. Okay, so, so once we are done by the, with the division, what we'll be left with is this product plus some constant. Okay, so, so sh shall, we, shall we carry out such a division? So, so we'll just do long division like you, you probably did in high school. So 4x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x plus 6. And we are dividing it by 3x plus 2. So how many times does this go into that? 3 times what equal to 4? Sorry? I'm sorry? Four thirds. four thirds, yeah, but what's four thirds here? Uh, mm. Three times three is nine. So three times six is eight, 18, which is, which, is, uh, which is four, right? Six threes are 18, so it's four. So, so... So we must multiply the, it by 6 times x squared to get 4x cubed. <coughs> so, so we multiply it by... So what we want to do is multiply this whole thing by 6x squared. So if you multiply this whole thing by 6x squared... Okay, then we'll get 4 times x cubed plus 6 to the 12, which is 5 plus 5x squared. And now we subtract. So we get ri rid of the x cubed term. <coughs> right? Is, is everyone with me? Yeah. Okay. So what? <laughs> All right. So let's, let's try again. So wh what do I want to do? I want to, you know, we, we, are, we, are trying to, we are trying to do long division here. <laughs> right? So I want to multiply this polynomial by something. So I want to multiply 3x plus 2 by, by something so that by some polynomial, right? So that what I get here cancels out the 4x cubed. Okay, so what would I multiply this by so that I get 4x cubed? Okay, so, well, what, you know, in order to get x cubed, I'd better multiply it by x squared. 
And in order to get four, I'd be better multiply it by something such that something times three equal to four. So what times three equal to four? I claim that six times three equal to four, right? Yes, does anybody, six times three equal to four, is, is it? Am I getting? Yeah, six times three is four. Okay, so, so, so I'd better multiply by 6x squared. It's, it's all mod 7. Remember, we fixed a prime q equal to 7 in the beginning, and we said everything we are doing is mod 7, right? So, okay? Okay, so, so what are we saying? Well, what times 3 equal to 4? Well, 6 times 3 equal to 4. So we had better multiply by 6 times x squared. So we are multiplying 3x plus 2 by 6x squared. And we'll get some polynomial. We'll get something times x cubed plus something times x squared. And we'll subtract that the something times x cubed plus something times x squared from this polynomial. Okay? But we chose these things cleverly so that we get 4 times x cubed. So that when we do the sub subtraction, all we are left with is x squared, x, and constant. Right? Okay, so we got, when we multiplied this by 6x squared, we got 4x cubed plus 5x squared. We do a subtraction, so, so this thing cancels. And then we get 2 minus 5 is 4, okay. 4x squared plus 3x plus 6, okay, that's a coincidence. But now what should we multiply it by? 6 times x, right? Because we want an x squared, so we multiply this by 6 times x. So we get 4x squared plus 6 times 2 is 5. Oh, yeah, it's the same thing. It's 5x. So now we subtract. We get rid of the x squared term. We get 3 minus 5 is 5. So we get 5x plus 6. And now what should we do? What should we multiply it by to get 5? Four, is it? Three fours are? Twelve. Okay, yeah. So four times three is five. So you get uh, five x plus two times four is one, plus one. And so you get the remainder is five, right? Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to write this, right? So this was six x squared plus, we got six x plus, plus four. Okay, so... So now what we can say is 4 times x cubed plus 2 times x squared plus 3 times x plus 6 equal to 3x plus 2 times 6x squared plus 6x plus 4, okay, this thing, plus a remainder, and what's the remainder? It's 5. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I, I thought that usually in a long division, the, whatever's left in the yeah, 5 over here is x cubed. So. Uh, well, if you, if you divide uh, both sides by 3x plus 2, then you'd get this divided by... But, but in long division, you just write it as p1 of x equal to p2 times x plus rx. Right, so the remainder is just that. Okay? Okay, so here what we were doing is we were doing, you know... We are just merrily working with, you know, we are doing arithmetic with polynomials. So we are doing, you know, if you want to add, subtract, multiply polynomials, even divide polynomials, right? So I, I just intentionally picked sort of the most complicated operation of them all, right, which is division. And you can see there's no problem dividing even when you're working mod a prime. It's, it's just as though you're working mod, an mod, mod real number, you know, not mod, but over real numbers. Except now what you're doing is you're just working modular prime. And, and the main point is, you can, when you're working modular prime, you can, you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and even division as long as you're not dividing by zero. So those are the properties that we're using. And so it's all okay, right? So it's okay to work with polynomials where the coefficients are taking modular. You just fix the prime, and that's, all, that's what you're working modular. Okay.
Okay, so so now let's let's try to let's try to um, sort of picture what these polynomials might look like. So so let's let's switch our prime to be well maybe maybe let's not even switch it. Let's let's say q is still seven, and we we look at two polynomials, two uh, x plus one is p1 of x, and p2 of x is 3x plus 4. Okay. And let's, let's just try to see what these polynomials look like. So here we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, Five, six. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So, so let's first let's first plot out p one of x. So let me let me write it like this: p one p one of x, and there's P2 of x. Okay, so what's what's P1 of zero? It's it's one. What's P1 of one? Four plus one, five, right? No, two times two plus two times one plus one is three. Uh, P2 of 1, 5. Right, so this seems to be following the straight line, which is what you expect when because the degree is 1. But then, then you have to wrap around. Right? So at, sorry, 0, 1, 2. I'd better draw some, some lines here because I can't. Quite keep things straight here. Okay, so, so, so now what about three? What what will happen at three? You'll go. Won't it be here? I, is it? At three you get seven, which is zero. So you come down here, and then you go up here, and then you go up here, and then you go up here. Okay, so that's that's what a line looks like mod 7. That's what one of these lines look, looks like. But what about this other line? What does it look like? Um, so, so P2 of 0 is 4. And then 3 times 1 plus 4 is 0. And then you'll go up by 1, 2, 3. Would it be 3? So you'll go up here. Then you'll go up by another three. And then you'll go up by one, two, three. Ah, okay, so so this is where the two lines intersect. Right? These are two lines. So they must intersect at one point. Right? And then you go up one, two, three, and you go up here, and one, two, three. Okay? So you can see it's it's still sort of you know that's the slope of the line, except it wraps around, it goes it goes up here, and then it goes keeps going, right? It just keeps wrapping around. Okay, is it is it clear? So it's sort of funny, right? And in, in some ways, it doesn't look at all like what what you'd expect. I mean, if you if you have two lines, you know. You, you expect them to look like this, they intersect in one point, and you know you, you, you draw this, and you know you have two roots, etc. right? And you, you get exactly that. You have one root, you know the, the first, first line has a root here, the second line has exactly one root here, exactly what you expect. It's a, it's a line it should cross exactly once, unless it was parallel and it's not. The two lines cross each other exactly once, okay? But then that's where the resemblance ends. Uh, you know it. You know, you, you sort of have to imagine the line if you if you wish. Right? 
Okay, so, so somehow things seem to have gotten complicated in one way, but they've also gotten much simpler in another way. So the, the sense in which they've gotten simpler is if you look at, if you look at this line, it takes on every value exactly once, right? So it takes on the value one exactly once, zero exactly once, two exactly once, three, four, five, and six, right? So every value mod, mod, mod Q, you know, the line took on that value exactly once. Same thing for the blue, blue line, exactly once here, once, right? You, you can see that, okay? So that's the symmetry we are looking for. That's what makes it so powerful, right, to be working modul modular prime. You know, because, because over the real numbers, what does it even mean, every real number exactly once? I mean, you know, so when we're working, you know, on a computer, we really want a discrete set. You know, we want only these values and no others, and just a finite set of values. And that's what we are getting here. Okay? Okay, so... So now let's go back and, and look at what we did last time with interpolation. Remember we did, we, we, we said, suppose that was property two, right? We said property two holds because given the d plus one values, we can, we can actually figure out what that polynomial is. And then we use property one to show that, that in fact the polynomial we figured out is unique. It's the only one possible. Okay, so, so now, Let's, yeah, yeah. Why does that happen? We'll, we'll see that in a minute. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm going to go over the general, you know, it, it'll follow from those general properties there. But, uh, but we'll actually do this in full generality and see what happens in, in general, okay? Okay, so um, okay, so let's let's go let's go ahead and try to try to do s another another example. So suppose we are still working mod seven, and suppose I this is zero one two three four five six. Okay, and suppose I give you two points and I say find me a line that goes through these two points. Okay, so there's zero one two three four, five, six. Okay, so, so let's just pick any two points. Right, so maybe the value at two should be what? Three, three maybe? And the value at what, what other point should be what? So maybe at, at five it should be four? Okay. So we want the line that goes through these. So we're saying, these are two points, there should be exactly one line that goes through them. There's a unique line that goes through them. So how would we figure this out? Right, so we are given a point, we are, we are, we are, we are told two, three, and five, four. Right, these are the two points we are given. This is x1, y1, x2, y2. And how would you figure out a line that goes through these? Okay. If these were real numbers, what would you do? You could do Lagrange interpolation, but what, did, what, what would you have done in high school to figure out the... <coughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, so you'd, you'd, do, you'd, you'd, you'd use the slope, right? So you'd say, well, what's the slope? It's y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. That's the slope, and that should be the same slope when you, when you have a general xy. So it should be equal to y minus y1 divided by x minus x1, and now you get y in terms of x, right? Okay, so, so let's just substitute. You'd say y minus y1 is uh, y minus 3 divided by x minus 2 is equal to 
y minus 4 divided by x minus 5. No, not y. It's, um, sorry, this was y2 minus y1. 4 minus 3 divided by x2 minus x1. 5 minus 2. Right, so, so we get y minus 3 divided by x minus 2 equal to 4 minus 3 over 5 minus 2. Right, so we get, uh, that's 1, that's 3, so we just multiply, right? So we get uh, or y equal to 3 plus x minus 2 times 1 divided by 3. Okay, that's not quite in the form we wanted, so what's, what's 1 over 3? One over three is five, isn't it? Okay, so three plus five times x minus two. <laughs> right, so y equal to five x minus ten plus three is <coughs> minus ten plus three is zero, isn't it? Oh my goodness. Okay, so that's what it is. Could it be? Yeah, two, 5 times 2 is 3, and 5 times 5 is? Is 4. Okay, so it's good. Okay? Yeah. Oh, because 1 third is 5, isn't it? <laughs> we, are, we are working modulo 7. Q, Q is 7. Remember, we are doing, you know, here, here we said we pick a prime and we are, we are doing all our arithmetic mod that prime. Right? So, so what's one third? Well, three times five is, is one. Yeah. Sorry, did the slope turn out to be zero? It's five, right? Why is it five? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, in okay. So can you can you say that? Um, can you say the question in a different way? Um, what, what would you what, what would what would be a satisfactory answer? What kind of thing would you? Oh, okay. So uh, you know, at, at one level, what we did was we did a calculation. It turned out to be five, right? But that's obviously not the answer you're looking for. So what what are you looking for? What does it mean that the slope is five? Okay, so so you know you see that red those red points there. So what's the slope there? It's two, right? And the reason it's two is that you you see the you see the red. The, you can imagine a, a line there. Of course, there's no line because we are not working over the reals. We are just working over modulo seven. So there's, there's nothing except those points, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But if you want, we could imagine a line. And if we imagine a line, it would be going up at that, at that angle, right? And then it wraps around and it wraps around. But if you look at that line, it has slope 5. Okay, so similarly out here, the, the, what's the next point? What, what would it look like? 3 times 5 is 1. Okay, so, so, so it would be here. Now, if you imagine, how did you get from here to here, right? You, you had a slope of 5, and you went up to here, right? And that, that, that wrapped around to there. So, so you really, well, it wasn't here. It was one more, right? It was that kind of a slope. And from here, where would you go at 4? 4 times 5 is 6. So you'd go up all the way here, and now you can see the slope. It's 5, <coughs> right? So that's... And then the next one, well, you wrap around and you go here, right? So that, that's why the slope is 5. Yeah. Sorry, there was a question here once upon a time. Did that get answered? Okay. Is, is everybody now comfortable with, with doing a arithmetic modulo a prime? Yeah, it takes a little bit of doing, but once you think about it, it's pretty natural, right? Yeah? Okay. 
Okay, by the way, by the way, we, we did the interpolation like this, you know, using the high school formula. But, but now, what if you did the interpolation using Lagrange? Would you get the same answer? And can you show that you'd get the same answer? No? Do you want to... S okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice exercise. It's worth doing. But let me, let me show you the first couple of steps so that you, so that you can sort of see. So how, how would we do Lagrange on this? Right? Well, what would we actually do? So we'd set up these two polynomials, right? One, which is, which is one here and zero there. Remember, okay, Lagrange. How do you do Lagrange? There was this, there was this terrible puzzle, right? You do x minus a times so on up to x minus z. That's what we are doing, right? Right, you, you set it up so that you, you set up a polynomial of degree d minus one or d, which is, uh, which is zero at every other point that, you're, that you care about. In this case, you care about only these two points. So you make it zero at this point and one here. And then you don't care what it looks like everywhere else because those are points you don't care about. So you only care about these two points, right? So you make it so that it's one here and zero here. And then you make another polynomial, which is zero here and one there. And then you take the appropriate multiples. So you take three times the first polynomial plus four times the second polynomial. OK, so, so let's do this. So we say y equal to three times, well, three. Let's see what's, what's that. You know, let's do it in terms of x1, y1, x2, y2. So you can see what's going on. So it's y1 times the first polynomial. Uh, times the first polynomial, whatever it is, plus y2 times the second polynomial. Okay, so now let's fill in the first polynomial. So the first polynomial, what we want it to be is 1 here and 0 there. Right? How do we get 0 there? We make, we make the value equal to, so we look at the polynomial x <coughs> minus 5. So, so it should be x minus 5. And now the value should be 1 here. So what's the value here? It's uh, x minus 5. Well, it was x minus y2, x2, right? x minus, this is x2, right? Uh, this, this, this particular thing is x2. And now what, what, what do we want? Uh, we want the value of it to be 1 here, right, at x1. So what's its value at x1? It's x1 minus x2. So you clearly want to divide by x1 minus x2. And what about here? What polynomial do we want? Well, we want x minus x1 so that it has value 0 at x1. So we take x minus x1. But we also want, to, want its value to be 1 at x2. But what's, what's the value at x2? It's x2 minus x1. So we divide by x2 minus x1. OK? And now. You see, you get the same sorts of things here, x, x minus x1, x2 minus x1, y1, y2, etc. And now, if you, if you just rearrange this, you'll get that. Okay? Except for the fact that when we wrote this expression, it was asymmetric. Right? We picked out... So this was symmetric, y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. That's, that's okay, that's symmetric. This was asymmetric. We picked out x1, y1 to work with rather than x2, y2. We could have picked x2, y2 here as well. Whereas this thing is completely symmetric in x1 and x2. Right? But if you rearrange the terms, you get, you get the same thing. Okay? So, so, so that's what shows you that you know, you'll, you'll get the same answer regardless of which way you work with it. Okay? Except, of course, this only worked for degree 1 and Lagrange works for any degree. Okay, how you, oh yeah, question. Why do, you, why do you divide? Okay, remember what we are trying to do. This is x1, this is x2. So this was x1 equal to 2, x2 equal to 5. These are the two, two points we care about, right? And what did we say? We wanted a polynomial, we wanted to create a polynomial whose value was 1 at x1 and 0 at x2, right? So in order to do that, we took the polynomial x minus x2. 
right? When you, when you substitute x equal to x2, it has value 0. But then when you substitute x equal to x1, it does not have value 1. So how do you get 1? You just divide by whatever its value is at x1. So what's the value at x1? It's x1 minus x2. So you divide by that. And now its value is 1 at x1. Right? Okay. In general, if there were not two points you care about but, but three, what would you do? Well, you'd, you'd have something that's 1 here, 0 here, and here, right? x2 and x3. So then what, what polynomial would you use? You'd use not x minus x2, but x minus x2 times x minus x3. So that, that has value 0 at x2 and x3. And then what would you do? You'd substitute x1 in there. So you get x minus x2 times x minus x3. X, sorry, x1 minus x2 times x1 minus x3. That's the value at x1. And then you divide by that because you want value 1 there. Right? So, so this is just that same general procedure for Lagrange. That's all we are following. Right? In the special case where degree is 1. Yeah? Okay. How are you doing for stamina? Is this... Uh, we, yeah. Why do you divide by x1 minus x2? Well, remember, this polynomial, it takes on value 0 here, 1 here, and then we don't care what, what its value is at other points, right? So all we care about is that the value here is 0, value here is 1, right? So at x2, its value is 0. Why? Because x minus x2 is, at x2, is 0. Now, what about at x1? Well, it's x1 minus x2 divided by something. So what should you divide by? You want the value 1. The value is x1 minus x2 divided, you know, uh, so what, what should you divide by? It's exactly x1 minus x2. Well, because x is an unknown, so we, we want to divide by a constant. So that when we, when we substitute x equal to anything, we get a polynomial. But when you substitute x equal to x1, we should get 1. So x is an unknown, whereas x1 and x2 are known quantities. x1 is 2, x2 is 5 in our case. But, in, you know, but, but x1 and x2 are given to you, y1 and y2 are given to you, x and y are unknowns. Okay. Shall we take a one-minute break?
Okay. So let's see. So last time we showed, actually we showed it again, well, more or less worked through it t today, except not in full, full generality, that property one implies property two, right? So property two says, well, there, there is a polynomial given d plus, d plus one points. There's a polynomial of degree d that goes through them and that it's unique. But the way sh we showed it was unique was through property one, right? We said, suppose that, okay, le let's, let's just go through that, that proof that, that it's unique, right? So we, we, sh we create a polynomial through Lagrange, but then how do we show it's unique? Well, we say, suppose that there are two, two such polynomials. So suppose we have P1 of X and P2 of X, which both have the property that they go through all those D plus one points, such that P1 of Xi equal to Y sub I and P2 of Xi equal to Y sub I. So now what we said was, let's look at a different polynomial, S of X equal to P1 of X minus P2 of X. What's the degree of S of X? Well, we know P1 is of degree D and P2 is of degree D. Right? When we add, subtract polynomials, the degree doesn't change. So, so S of X is also of degree D. Right? So this has degree D. Or at most D. Now, what is S of Xi? Well, it's Yi minus Yi equal to zero. So X sub i is a root of S. How many such X sub i's are there? They are exactly D plus one. So you have, here you have a polynomial of degree D with D plus one roots. So that's a contradiction. Why, do, why is it a contradiction? Because property one tells us that a polynomial of degree D has at most D roots. Okay? So our assumption must be, must be incorrect. So what did we assume? We assumed that there were two polynomials which were different from each other. So it can't be the case, right? So, so the polynomial must be unique. Okay, so, so now we got all this mileage from property one. So you might wonder, well, what does it take to prove property one? And the answer is not very much. It's the same, you know, it's the same things, being able to add, multiply, subtract, divide. That's all we need. That, th those are the only properties we need in order to in order to show this. So how do we do this? Well, what we show is that if you have a polynomial of degree D and it has, it has let's say that it has um, D distinct roots. So it has D roots, A1 through A sub D. Okay. So then what we'll claim is that P of X can be written as some constant times X minus A1 times X minus A2 times so on up to X minus A sub D. Okay, so if it, if it has D distinct roots, then you can always write it in this form. Okay, now, why does this show you that it can't have a D plus first root? So suppose you have another root. So suppose A, which is not equal to A sub I for I equal to one to D, is also a root. So, or is it possible? Well, let's, let's write it in a different way. So is this possible? Is it possible that there's an A which is not one of these D roots, such that P of A is zero? Well, just, just fig let, let's figure out. Let's just substitute P of A, right? So P of A equal to C times A minus A1 times A minus A2 times so on A minus A sub D. C is not equal to zero, such that C is not equal to zero. A minus A1 is not equal to zero. Why is A minus A1 not equal to zero? Because A is not equal to A1. A minus A2 is not zero. 
a minus a sub d is not zero. When you take the product of all these non-zero things, you, will, you won't get zero, right? Mod a prime, you cannot take two, you know, any time you take numbers which are not zero, you take their product, you, you get something which is not zero. Right? And so this is not equal to zero. Okay, so all we have to do is to show that P can be written in this form. So how do we show that? Well, it's sort of easy. What, what we do is do, it one, you know, do one step of it, and then we do an induction. So how do we do one step of it? Well, the first claim is that if, if AI is a root of Okay, if, if A is a root of P of X, then P of X can be written as X minus A times Q of X, where degree of Q of X equal to D minus 1. Right? If this had degree D, then you can always write x minus a, p of x as x minus a times q of x, where the degree of q of x is d minus 1. So why is this true? Well, you just divide, right? So you take p of x, you divide by x minus a. Right? So, so, so divide p of x by x minus a. That's what we did in the beginning of class, right? We divided one polynomial by another. We said, well, what happens when, when you divide p of x by x minus a? You write p of x equal to x minus a times some polynomial q of x plus r of x, where the degree of this is less than the degree of the thing you're dividing by, is less than 1. So what, what's the degree of r of x? It must be equal to zero, and so, so this is just a constant r, right? Okay, so, so now what do we get? Well, what we know is that a is a root, which means when you substitute x equal to a, you get zero. So p of a equal to zero, why? Because a is a root, is equal to is equal to a minus a is what? 0 times q of x is what? 0 plus r. And so what this tells you is r equal to 0. And that's what we said here. Right? So now what we have is p of x is x minus a times q of x. So, so we at least started with one thing here. And now what do we do? We do an induction. Okay, so now the claim one implies claim by induction. Right, this claim one implies that claim. Okay, sorry. Let's not call it claim. Let's call it claim zero. Just to number it, claim zero by induction. Right? Induction on what? So what would you induct on? <coughs> so what would you do an induction on here? On it was a degree here, right? D. Okay. So how, how does the proof go? The base case. That's easy, that's an exercise. Induction hypothesis. The hypothesis is just going to say that claim zero holds up to degree d. Claim zero holds for d. And then how does the step go? 
So you start with P of X of degree D plus 1. So P of X of degree D plus 1. And it has d plus 1 roots, right? So a1 through a sub d plus 1, they are the d plus 1 roots. Okay. And now what we say is that by claim 1, since a sub d plus 1 is a root, p of x can be written as x minus a sub d plus 1 because a sub d plus 1 is a root, times q of x, where q of x has degree d. OK. I claim we are, we are essentially done, right? Because what do we know now? q of x has degree d. If we can show that q of x satisfies the conditions of claim 0, then we are done. Right? So if you can show that a1 through a sub d are all roots of q of, q of x, which is of degree d, then by the induction hypothesis, q of x must be of the form c times x minus a1 times x minus a2 times all the way up to x minus a sub d. And then we go back and say, well, q of x is of that form, and then we pick up an x minus a sub d plus 1. So we are done. That's what the, that's what the claim says. right? So now, why, why is each of these a sub, why, why is a1 through a sub d, why are all these roots of q of x? Well, you see, they are roots of p. So p of a1, for example, p of a sub i, where i goes from 1 to d, is 0, right? Because they are all roots. But then we'll get a sub i minus a sub d plus 1. What's ai minus ad plus 1? Well, you know, i is between 1 and d, so these are different roots. So this is non-zero, right? So 0 equal to non-zero times this thing, so this must be 0, right? So that tells us q of a sub i equal to 0 for i equal to 1 to d. So it has those d plus 1 d roots, so... So therefore, by the induction hypothesis, q of x equal to x minus a1 times dot 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 times x minus a sub d times c, times some constant. Right? So now you can just substitute that back in here, and you get that times x minus a d plus 1. So that's your proof by induction. Yeah? I'm sorry? What if you are, no, but this said, this said you can have, you know, if you have D distinct roots, then, right? Okay. Yeah. Just clarify, the repeated roots wouldn't matter either way. The argument is still held the same way, right? You'd have to work at it. But since, since what we are, all we are trying to say is that the number of roots is at most D, then we can, we can assume they are distinct, because if they are not, it's even better for us. Right? OK, so, okay, so le let, me try to, let me try to summarize what we've seen so far. So what we've said so far is, when we are working with polynomials, First of all, we can work modulo a prime, and everything is fine, you know, because we are doing arithmetic mod a prime. It, you know, all the properties that we want still hold, because the properties just rely on being able to do arithmetic. And the properties that we care about are these two properties, that a polynomial of degree d has at most d roots, so a line, you know, a line will cross at most once as long as the it's not exactly the x-axis, so as long as the polynomial is not identically zero. And that given d plus 1 points, you can uniquely reconstruct the polynomial. So any line you can reconstruct uniquely by specifying two points. Right? Okay. And in order to prove these two things, all we used was arithmetic, so that's why it was okay to work modulo prime. And now, now we should go back and see why 
Why this was so nice for us? Why was it so good for us to work modulo a prime? Okay, and that has to do with counting. So, so we, are, we are working modulo q, which is a prime. And now let's count how many polynomials are there of degree d. Okay, so there are two ways we can do this because, well, we have p of x equal to a sub d x to the d plus dot 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 plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. Okay. So we have to pick all these coefficients, and how many of them are there? Well, they are d plus 1. Each one we can pick in q different ways because we are working mod q. So the number of polynomials equal to, so there are, there are d plus 1 coefficients, each of which can be picked in q ways. So we'll get q raised to the power of d plus 1. Right, there are q ways of picking the first one. For each way of picking that, there are q ways of picking the second one. For each way of picking the first two, there are q ways of doing the third one, and so on. So it's q times q times q times q, q to the d plus 1. Yes? You can't have it be 0, because we mean polynomial of degree at most d. So, so usually when we say this, we, we, you know, under our breath, we're always saying at most, most of the time, because for these properties, we are saying, you know, so for, oh, sorry, sorry, where did it disappear? It's for, for these properties, you know, when we said there's a unique polynomial which we can reconstruct of degree, well, it's always at most d, right? Because, um, yeah. Okay. Now, there's another way of counting how many polynomials there are of degree d, which has to do with with this second property, with, with property 2, which says you can specify the polynomial uniquely just by specifying its value at d plus 1 points. Right? So we can, we can pick d, d plus 1 points. So let's just specify x1, x2. We fix them in some way, xd plus 1. And now, to specify the polynomial, so we could fix these to be 1, 2, up to d plus 1. It doesn't matter what you pick, fix them to. But now, the way you sp specify a polynomial is by specifying the value at each of these points. So how do you specify the value? It's going to be some number between, you know, it's, it's, it's some number mod q, so there are exactly q choices for the first one, q for the second, q for the d plus first. Right, so, so there, there are q possible y sub i, right? For, for each one, y1, y2, etc. And they are d plus 1 of those, so there's exactly q to the d plus 1. Okay. Now, this is something very interesting. You can write the polynomial in two different ways. You can either write it by writing down the coefficients, or you can take any d plus 1 points, e any d plus 1 places, and you can write out what the values are at those d plus 1 places. Right? It doesn't matter which of these you use. One of, the, one of these is called the coefficient representation. And this is called the value representation. Okay. There are certain things which are easy to do in the coefficient representation. What's easy to do here is if you want to evaluate the polynomial at a certain x, it's easy to do it here because you just, you know, it's, it's very easy to compute this value. It takes roughly d steps. Here, if I, if I ask you what's the value at x, where x is not, well, if, it's, if, if x happens to be one of these x sub i's, then it's easy. You just look it up. But if it's a different value, then what do you have to do to evaluate the polynomial at x? Well, now you would have to do Lagrange interpolation first 
and then figure out the polynomial, and then sub substitute x, and then you'll get the value. So it's, it's, very, it's a hard process here to compute the value. But then there are other things which are easy here and hard here. So for example, if I give you two polynomials, p1 and p2 of x, and I ask you to multiply them together, what do you do to multiply p1 of x times p2 of x? What's, what's, what's p1 of x times p2 of x at x equal to x1? So if you have p1 of x times p2 of x, and if you want to evaluate this polynomial at x equal to x1, what's, what's the value? It's p1 of x1 times p2 of x1. Right, so you just take the value at x1, value at x1 of the other one, and you just multiply them together. What if you have to multiply two polynomials in this representation? That's hard, right? Because you get all these cross terms, and you'll get d squared of them. So, so there are some things which are easy in this representation, some things that are easy in that representation. So what you'll see in, in CS170 is that this is the basis for the fast Fourier transform. Okay. And you can also look at it in terms of these linear systems, right? So right? The, the, the way you solve, uh, you know, if you have these linear time invariant systems, what you do in electrical engineering, the way you solve that is you take the Fourier transform. And why do you do that? Well, it's this representation versus that <laughs> representation. Okay, so you'll see this in many places. I mean, this is a very fundamental thing. Okay. But for, from our point of view, you know, it comes up for completely different reasons. Okay, okay so, so now, now we said, well, suppose, suppose we, no, suppose that instead I tell you, you know, I fix, suppose I fix y sub 1. And I ask you, how many polynomials are there such that, of, of degree d, such that at, at x1 the value is y1? How many polynomials are there? Well, so you know, you know that this is y1, but all these are still completely free. So there's q possibilities for each of them, and so you'd get q to the d. Okay. And now suppose that I fix y1, y2, so on up to y sub d. So I fix all the points except one. Right? So there were d plus 1 here. There was a unique polynomial that goes through those, but now I fix all of them except one. Now how many polynomials are there that such that of, de of degree at most d such that p of x1 equal to y1, x2 equal to y2, x sub d equal to y sub d? How many should there be? Exactly Q, right? The reason is you can let Y sub D plus 1 be each value, 0, 1, 2, et cetera, et cetera, up to Q minus 1. And for each such value, you have a unique polynomial of degree D that goes through it. Right? So that's, that's the really nice property here that these polynomials have. So what I can do is I can say, well, here's x1, x2, x3. Right? And I can, I can say, well, I'm fixing these values. And now I have a polynomial of degree 3 that I want. And maybe there's, there's x0 here, right? And I want to know how many possible you know, how many possible different values can x naught, uh, can, can the polynomial take at, at x naught? What's y naught equal to? Well, I claim that for every way that you fix y naught, there's exactly one polynomial of degree 3, right? So if d equal to 3, that's determined by four points. If you only specify 3, then there's, there's exactly q ways of specifying the fourth point. And for each way of specifying it, there's exactly one polynomial of degree 3. It's this kind of symmetry that makes these polynomials so, so useful. Okay, so how useful does it make them? Well, here's, here's how useful. So, 
So back in the back in the 1950s and 60s, um, when the Cold War was at, at its height, you know, there was this, there was, there was, you know, it was considered that there was a real danger of of a nuclear attack, and so the thought was that the president could not, you know, could not be guaranteed to have his, his finger on the nuclear button. And so, you know, the, the possibility, you know, so, so, so this authority to launch, launch, launch a counter-strike had to be delegated to, to senior officials in the administration. But now this was, a, this was an extremely... Um, you know, this was an extremely sensitive thing. You know, what if you had, what if you had one of these officials who suddenly, you know, uh, um, you know, something happened to him and he happened to push the button? You know, that would be the end of the world, right? You couldn't, you couldn't afford for this to happen. So what, what did you want? Well, you wanted that there was a certain number of officials, and you know, let's say that there were, there were, there was, there was a group of um, ten such officials, and as long as at least three of them happened to agree that they should push the button, th- that was okay. So how would you achieve this? Well, you know, you might think of schemes where you take, where you have some secret key and you, you sort of make sure that you give each one of these 10 officials a part of the key, right? So, so let's say that you, you had the, even the simple case where there were three officials and all three had to agree, right? It, of course, gets much more complicated if you have 10 officials and, you know, at least three of them have to agree. Right? But, but let's say there were only three, and three of them had to agree. So, so you might think you take the secret key and you give one-third to each of them. But then even that's not desirable, because, because now, you know, if you have two of them who agree, who turn rogue, well, then they can figure out two-thirds of the key, and now suddenly the key is less secure than it, it was before. Because now all they have to do is guess one-third of the key. Right? Of course, if there were 10 of them and three of them had to agree, then it's not even clear how you get started with such a scheme. So now, how do you, how do you solve this using polynomials? So it turns out there's, this, there's a scheme called secret sharing, which allows you to do exactly this. So, so if you have any number of officials, you have 10 officials, you want at least three of them in order to figure out the secret. So you, you want to make sure any three can figure out the th- secret. Any three figure out the secret. Let me, let me say two, because that's, that's the case I'll show you. But it, it holds for any number, right? And you want that... So this, is, this, this number is going to be d plus 1. Any 1, any d have no information. So unlike that case, you know, where, where any, any two of them could figure out one third of the key, now if you have any, any D of them, you know, if you have one fewer than the number that can reconstruct the key, then they have absolutely no information at all. Right? So this seems like a, you know, if you, if you haven't seen the solution, it should seem like magic. Except that if you look at these properties of polynomials, it's very easy. So what do you do? Well, what we'll do, so since we, since we want any two to reconstruct, we'll take a polynomial of degree two. Okay, so, so we have our secret. Our secret is S. It's a number mod Q. So it's between zero and Q minus one. That's our secret. Then we take a random other number. So at one, we take, take some random number, R, and we draw the line that goes through these. Okay? So, so we, we, we take the line, we, th- we take the polynomial, the unique polynomial of degree one. Right? So there's, there's a line that goes through these. So, so you take P of X equal to AX plus B. So this is our unique line. And now what do you do? You, you take these you know, if you have 10 such officials, you, you give, give each of them, you, you give them P of 1, P of 2, P of 10. 
Okay? Now, if any two of them get together, since it's a polynomial of degree one, they can figure out exactly what this polynomial is. Interpolation, right? And then they substitute x equal to zero, and they figure out what s is. Okay? But now, I claim that any one of them by themselves, well, any one is holding on to this one point. And now, what's the property we have? Well, with one point, how many polynomials are there? Well, exactly Q of them, right? One for each value of S, right? So there's a line that goes through this and zero. There's a line that goes through this and one, this and two, up to this and Q minus one. So as far as this official goes, there was absolutely no information at all about what the secret was. Okay? So any two of them got exactly, they could figure out the secret. Any one of them had absolutely no idea. How do you, how do you change it so that you have d plus 1 versus d? Right? For, any d plus, for any value of d. So, so you do exactly the same thing. Instead of picking one other value, now you pick how many other values? So you pick d of them, right? If d equal to 3, you pick, pick a random value here. You pick a random value here. You pick a third random value here. And now you interpolate to get a polynomial of degree 3. And now, after you interpolate to get this polynomial of degree 3, you hand out p of 1, p of 2, p of 3, up to as many, as many officials as there are. Okay? Now, any three of these officials get together. What can they figure out? So any three of them get together. Okay, so they, they have these three values. Now they want to figure out the secret. What's the secret? Well, you know that given these three values, you can take on any value you want at zero, right? For every value here, there's a unique polynomial of degree three that goes through these points and this one. So three of them have absolutely no idea what the secret is. Now what happens if you have four of them? Well, four of them can uniquely figure out the polynomial. They do interpolation. Once they do that, they substitute x equal to zero, they get the constant term, and that's the secret. Right? OK, so, so I hope this convinces you that this property, these two properties of polynomials, that the fact, you know, these are extremely powerful. And so in the next lecture, we'll see even more beautiful uh, properties of them.